Hi, this is Joel Minty. I'm unpublished, but I'm going to be reading from my short story, Rag the Grenadier, uh, which came second in the Grimdark uh, Battle Royale number four, uh, and made me very proud. And it's like a done thing, so instead of a little chapter, I thought I'd read that. Uh, it comes from uh, the same world as my book series, Imbalance, which I'm working on. All right, here's how it goes. <clears throat> Rag the Grenadier. Rag knew how to hide in a body. Hiding next to a body was one thing. In most any applicable state of decay, it would stink. And hiding beneath a body was another. Fluids found their way down once freed. But hiding in a body was wholly different. To most, an act unfathomable, but Rag could fathom it. So it was no longer grotesque. It was a challenge, and challenges could be mastered. Rag was a master. He considered the art of it from his hiding spot, still as the twelve decomposing bodies choking the alley with their bloat, carefully chosen and murdered just so. Their noxious expose was calculated to precision. Three days of rot in the broiling alleys of Crux, cooking the juices as surely as the bodies expelled them. Anyone who might object to such wanton pestilence in the streets had long since avoided Crux, their entire lives. Rag remembered his mother burning herself on the oven and waving her injured hand in the air as if to shed the sparks of heat. Such callous skin ignored such rudimentary pain. Do anything long enough and it becomes commonplace to the senses. Rag was wholly attuned to the distinct and pungent odor of a cadaver, his smell receptors waving it away with the disinterested huff of a tired laborer. Being next to a rotting body principally required this one skill, handle the smell, and, he supposed, the child's level discomfort with dead things. And the body became far less distressing, far less disgusting, depending on the wounds, mind you. But still, any man who sticks his penis into the living without batting an eye can't go on complaining about those. Now lying next to a body also left one in the open. The human brain was far likelier to identify a threat from what was, visibly, a whole human whose eyes were shut than from a pile of guts, and Rag knew it was little use to carve up one's own anatomy. He tried. His arms and legs were kneaded whole. An itch chafed the bridge of his nose. But Rag ignored it with a practiced restraint. The time was coming soon, and stillness was paramount. Hiding under a body or pile of bodies, as the situation called for it, was an altogether greater challenge, one mastered as a teenager. If the corpses were fresh, they would leak on you. Thick, wet slop, all manner of garish color, or thin rivulets of watery blood or urine that, given half a chance, soaked your garments. They would attract bugs and rodents. Bloating corpses, such as the ones currently keeping him company, had their own putrid biles, usually soupier and uncontrollable. These were heavier to maneuver in and out from and attracted scavengers. Both obstacles could be overcome with simple determination. Insects were the inevitability of the trade, and rodents knew their dead flesh from their live meat, but scavengers were the biggest threat. The scavengers grew angry when a live human spoiled their feast, and then they made noise. Noise drew attention. Attention drew failure. As a result, a three-day job, such as this one, was the greater setup, the greater risk, the greater challenge. The greater reward, oh, what I will do with 250 again. He wiggled the finger on his cramped hand, rubbing along the top of his clip pouch. He was only half under a pile at the moment. Six of the bodies were splayed about the mouth of the alley, murdered and draped on top of each other to create a genuinely upsetting clog, prompting a sensible person to head deeper into the alley as opposed to wedging themselves through such gross confines. These were also carefully placed to best disgust the uninitiated, one with heart-slick guts and a full set of ribs forced open, another with half a face lopped off. People react best to threats to the face and the heart the face and their vanity, and the heart because it has been forever safe within the cage of bones. 
Both are good to dissuade, or better, induce vomit. Three more cadavers were piled near the other end, beyond the door he watched. These were lumped aside to allow for narrow passage, their faces and guts mercifully hidden from human eye, and they rounded out the scene as if yet another street brawl turned ugly. The others were part of his hiding spot. First, the woman, a tougher-looking sort. She sat upright next to him, her head caved in and her shoulders slumped in accordance. She created a vertical screen and drew the eye with her warrior's garb. Then it was Rag and the corpse he occupied. Hiding in a body took time, focus, skill, and dedication, plus about two nights of uninterrupted work best done at the sight of the death. Once his chosen six clogged the alley mouth from the rest of the skin district, and the door was bolted from without, he was free to work away at his corpse in relative peace. The foreman always gave him a wide berth. Rag chose the gentleman he chose, because he was the biggest of the bodies and thus easier to hollow out. First he had to remove some ribs and tissue and bore a hole from back to front that could fit his torso with a little work. These could then be scattered across the alley. Extracting the femur came next, but this bone was better disposed of. Then he dug into a limb of choice, the leg working best, to leave it as hollow as possible, without losing its exterior consistency. Once it was capable of being a sleeve for his arm, he got to work on the rest of the body, ensuring it outdid the others. The sight should turn heads in immediate disgust, but leave a picture vivid enough no right-minded person would imagine what it concealed. Placement was key. The woman next to him gave a narrow slab of wall against which to cram his legs. The butchered leg of the gentleman provided a cavity for him to hide a good arm, one whose shoulder was decorated in a bloody mess but was otherwise hale enough to hoist him up. Being face down allowed him to cram his other arm beneath, wedging it within his coat so as to not be visible to the layman. One of the fellows from the clog provided the blood pooled beneath his face. Rag opened an eye a slit. It was best to let his ears pick up the approach of his mark or the squeal of the door hinges, but he could not help admiring the bloody pool that sucked on his half-exposed face. The smooth puddle of brownish-red still reflected the dusty crux and air above, but it was much dimmer with each passing day. Now he could barely make out the sun. Beyond the pool, the alley remained, iron barred door tight to the wall, and the rest of the corpses as they were when last he risked a peek. A rat was wrinkling its nose in the middle of the stone passage between buildings, and as Rag watched, brethren skittered out from the folds of the woman next to him, chittering over something edible. All was set. The corpse encompassing him was warm as a mother's hug. The alchemical solution stoppered in its custom-built jar waited at the end of a fuse for a flick of the finger. He closed his eye. Not long now. A room and a lady. Don't have any ladies available, sir. I oh, of course you don't, Denna. Of course you don't. The proprietress of the admittedly reputable and pristinely clean establishment still looked herself a whore, no matter how tarted up. But her savvy, haggling side did not show up today, as her current knew it would not. Instead, her eyes glazed over with the fondest of fondnesses, and she leaned in a fraction to bring cleavage to the game. She has dealt with the princeling before. My lord, she murmured, sweeping out from behind the counter, to what do I owe the pleasure? and she curled pleasure around her tongue like a cat curled around an owner's foot. For little old me, the princeling postured, carefully handing his coat off to one of the six men waiting on him and stretching his fingers, aching as they were, under such an assortment of rings. You owe no pleasure. It is mine to give, and I am always prepared to do so. Have you not heard of my famous pleasure? Recurrent imagined the boy pleasured himself more often than not, but has always kept words to himself. Instead, he surveyed the room, as his role was supposedly that of a bodyguard, and anyone with sharp eyes would tell he knew nothing of his employ if he could not even act the part. The front parlor, or whatever of whatever this place was called, was utterly empty, a stark contrast compared to most such establishments, but a princeling would never give his pleasure to just any old hole in the wall, and in the skin sector, most any old hole would be sure to take it. 
Denna cooed her way through a series of the princeling's jostling sexual advances, both knowing the age gap was enough to nip such an act at the bud, but only one knowing whose bud would be nipped. A loose arm around the boy's shoulder brought the octet deeper into the building through a winding, winding corridor. A moment later, it opened into a wider room with more doors and walls. A variety of near do wells paraded around here, drunk, a lascivious, both, or in one sack, sack's case, neither. The rent paraded with them, fawning their way into contention with Miss Denna for being the most supplicating. Recurrent could not abide the sight and turned away, leaning against the wall and tucking his hat down over his face, while the other six guards, or yes-men, or whoever, roamed about and enjoyed the fruits of their princeling's good graces. In short order, the lad was ushered away by an ambitious girl, closer to his age, while only two of the six members of his entourage refrained from spending his clips in order to do their jobs. Recurrent did not care. He rested as close to sleep as he ever seemed to get. For a long time, nothing happened. Girls and boys and patrons came and went, and Recurrent waited as with the best company on the bench, sorry, on, of the bunch, his own thoughts. This detail will soon be over. It has to be. Remember, the best are the best, because they endure the worst. Swishing robes and rushing footsteps from the corridor snapped Recurrent to attention, but he remained still beneath his wide-brimmed hat, waiting and listening. Whoever came was wheezing hard, as if having run all six sectors full circle. A slight peek at the man as he passed showed an older gentleman of crux, which was to say a gnarled and feckless brute, out of shape and showing it. Across three sectors, then. Just poorly. Where is the whelp of cold Bullerian? He barks to no one in particular. Recurrent flinched at the name. There were too many reputations in this city. The boy! Where's the boy? Lifting a finger... He pointed at the door. Not my problem, the kid is busy groping or crying. The pampered thug rushed off and barged into the room, yelling all the while, but his presence was enough to get the others moving about, banging on doors and shouting into rooms. All of the entourage were assembled before the princing showed himself. The recurrent yet waited by the entry. It took a moment to pull away vertical, because his expensive coat momentarily stuck to the wall. Finally, the boy appeared. To his credit, wearing pants, gone was the jovial fun of puberty mischief, shaken by fear as the seasoned nagna shakes leaves from the trees. I know that look. Daddy's coming. Sure enough, the boy's rotund handler confirmed his suspicions. You lot, get him out of here. The oligarch is coming here now, and your charge cannot be here. Out the back. Go, go. As the princing threw his shirt on and Denna lamented the fort clip owed her, Recurrent swept into the lead, keeping his steps light and his eyes sharp. Partway down the corridor, he branched off, guessed, and then found a nondescript door, side door, no doubt used for just such a purpose. A quick glance back showed the others bumbling in his wake, like he the coin, and they a gaggle of beggars. Out into the light of day, Recurrent hesitated a moment as the alley was littered with dead bodies. His eyes sharpened to each, unmoving, before ushering the princeling and his handler through into just another alleyway in Crux. The moment his mark reached the trio of far-end bodies, Rag yanked on the cord and his, in his buried hand. He imagined the beautiful hiss of the fuse crackling in his ear way down at the other end, and then he opened his eyes when the alley exploded. The roar was deafening, and perfect as billows of orange flames rapidly enveloped the living, pluming outward and upward and shearing lacquered paint off from the walls. Bodies, both old and new, hurtled through the air in shreds, their limbs bursting loose or burning raw as they flopped into walls or sizzled to a crisp. A welcome inferno seared Rag's face, his own rash of puckered flesh running hot to remember a sensation so familiar. Those eyes suffered in blistering pain. He only squinted a bit so as to best see the beauty of his handiwork. As the roar reached its climax and the pluming flames billowed their heat up into a thick funnel of smoke, Rag listened to the pitter-patter of body parts as they speckled his end of the alley. Instinctually, he hoisted himself up. It never served to wait once the damage was delivered. Halfway to his feet, he glanced down the alley to find one man of eight 
hoisting himself up to find footing at the center of the blast radius. His coat smoked, but did not burn. Rag! Recurrent called through the haze, or he tried. His mouth was yet covered by the hook-around collar of his coat, and even through that, it was thick to catch a breath. He could see the murderer at the other end of the alley, rolling his way out from another husk. Rag! Recurrent tried again anyway, waving at the smoke as he stepped forward. The one they called the Grenadier stared at him, eyes wide as an owl, shock written on his face. He was covered in filth from head to foot, his red arm stained a deep crimson. Reaching fresher air, Recurrent ripped the collar away from his face to face his adversary. You! You didn't burn! The wretch exclaimed, befuddled and pathetic lip always twitching. No, he replied. I did not. Sloughing off the coat with the flex of his shoulders, Recurrent heard it crack and shed char as it hit the stones. The coating administered by the lady at the apothecary had fused with the bonded layer, creating a thick crust he was eager to be rid of. Some of this coating remained around his neck and wrists, a sticky, viscous glop, carefully chosen for its potency as a flame retardant. Coat cast away, he also tossed aside his ruined hat before drawing vindictive in a decisive motion. The three groove scimitar's metallic ring echoed up the alley walls. Which, Oleg, which, which oligarch do you work for? The deplorable spat his words, backing away through the alley mouth. Was uh, uh, backing away though the alley mouth was clogged with bodies. Recurrent advanced at a confident pace. The man appeared unarmed, but a gruesome reputation preceded him. No oligarch murderers. The oligarchs are scum. A good man needs no reason to kill one such as you. And he bolted, one moment stammering and backpedaling at a stagger, the next darting for the bodies piled at the end of the alley. Smirking and prepared for such desperation, Recurrent sprinted five long strides before Rag reached, reached the clumped bodies. But before the sixth, his smirk dried up as the killer slipped through an unperceivable gap. Damn it! He reached the corpses with bile rising in his throat. One's ribcage was pried open to an unnatural uniform, each bone a near image of its neighbor, and all bespattered in congealed blood. The gap the grenadier fled through was narrow but doable. All of his senses screamed at him to reconsider, but instinct insisted him through, and a hunter always listens to instinct. Wedging himself into the gap, he sidestepped through the tight confines of limbs and bloat, and then he got a face full of flies, furious at Rag's interruption, but taking it out on him. With a choking cough, he, a moment later he popped out into the street. Furious, he let his mark escape such a carefully conceived plan. He started running before his eyes found him. Rag was halfway to an adjacent alley, his gaunt legs and dragging rags kicking up dust as he shoved cruxens from his path. Recurrent set off low, scimitar held wide and obvious to help deter him a hole through the crowd. But drawn steel was as common as bartering in crux, and he ended up forced to shove and jostle no less than his mark. Blessed with long legs and a predator's determination, he pressed his advantage, gaining on the scoundrel before the grenadier banged his way around a corner and disappeared into another alley. Reaching its lip, Recurrent could not afford to slow, so he swung a cut at head level as he leapt around the corner. It met air, but what he saw calmed the beating drive of his heart. His boots sent a waft of dust up as they found purchase on the cobbles, and he straightened, a narrow smile cresting his lips at the sight of three of four sides, looming a dead end. Still spineless, the killer backed toward the far wall, a messy pile of barrels and wrought iron. Recurrent strode forward. He thought of saying something snide, something to provide closure, for his days spent preparing for the grenadier's heinous methods, and his time spent clopping around with an obvious target like the Borean princeling. But an overwhelming urge to finish the job and get the hell out of Crux, with its shit and its whoring and its haphazard knifings in the street, took control. An overwhelming urge to rid the world of such a foul specimen of humanity. Words could not provide the justice delivered by steel. Five steps. Four. A palsied hand reached into a ragged coat. Three. It came out throwing, a glass vial glinting in the light of midday. With an easy grace, Recurrent sliced the projectile on neatly in half. Two. The vial shattered into a thousand pieces, the mixture within splashing across the assassin's face and shoulders. A typical adversary would simply feel uncomfortable and wet, but one recently immersed in an explosion laced in... 
Tartarathin. Well, they instantly ignited wherever the latent chemical coating met the volatile liquid. The cemetery fell to the cobbles with a clatter as the assassin's wrists and neck foamed a bubbling fire. It burned sheer through the bones of his wrists, which dropped limp hands and boiled into his neck with a ferocity that ate away at the throat and clavicle until burrowing down into the belly of the corpse as it fell to its knees. A moment later, the rapid hissing of boiling skin dissipated, and the body hit the alley with a hollow thud. Rag the grenadier eyed the dead with disfavor, his sniveling no longer necessary. It was a risk that this recurrent would have the Lady Massa's retardant gel about his person and not just his coat. But Rag well knew the lady's habit for ensuring her patron's safety. Gaps between skin and clothing would burn if not protected. Rag knew himself. He was her chief patron, close enough to know the comings and goings about her business. After that, the only thing left was to track the man's false detail protecting the oligarch's rash of a son, and ensure they fled the back exit, of course. But nothing scared a lecherous lad like the ire of their betters. The lie was a sure bet to smoke his would-be killer out, and gladly paid for. Two hundred and fifty gen goes a long way out here, perhaps longer than anywhere else. He allowed himself a chuckle recognizing how very husk-like the corpse was before him. Barely have to carve this one out at all, and such curdled insides. He considered dragging the body with him. But no, not now. Now it was time to go. It never served to wait once the damage was delivered.